Hello everyone, this is Brad Wistens. Last week I published a video where I took a single stage space plane to the surface of Eve and back using ISRU to refuel on the surface. And I was real excited about this because it was a challenge that I always thought was impossible. And in the comments I had people suggesting other quote unquote impossible missions. One of the ones that I always wanted to be able to do was to go to Tylo and back on a single stage without ISRU. However, two and a half years ago, I had done a single stage to Tylo mission, but I did use ISRU to refuel on the surface. And this means that you only need enough fuel to make it from the surface of Kerbin to the surface of Tylo, and not back. Despite this, I was just barely able to pull it off, and as a result, I assumed that doing it without ISRU was impossible. However, when I actually went back and looked at the video, I realized I hadn't optimized some things in the mission that I could have. I hadn't used any ion engines. I think my choice of a Rhino engine to pair with the Rapiers was a bit questionable, and I didn't use wheel braking to save any Delta V. So I thought it'd be fun to attempt this without ISRU and just see how far I get. As I was working on figuring out the optimal selection of engines and the ratio between engines and the mass of the fuel and the amount of wings used, I discovered that I'd been making a bad assumption about how to best use rapier engines in this mission, and once I got rid of that assumption, suddenly the mass suggested that doing this might actually be possible. And once I figured that out, I had to do it. One of the unusual things about this design is that its mass is 230 tons, but it only has six rapier engines. This is a ratio of just over 38 tons per rapier engine, which is the highest I've ever used on a space plane. One of the drawbacks of this is that the runway isn't long enough enough for us to take off on, so we're going to use the ramp next to the runway to help us roll back, and suddenly we've gained a natural longer runway. The long takeoff run helps us with the second problem, which is that it's very hard to pick up speed with only six rapier engines until we're going at a higher velocity and the rapier engines have higher thrust. Once we get closer to 400 meters per second, the rapier engines gain a lot more thrust, and we really start picking up speed in earnest and can start climbing. The next disadvantage of limiting the number of rapier engines, and the reason I haven't done this in the past, is that doing so will limit the speed we can reach on just the rapier engines to about 1530 meters per second. Normally I can get closer to 1700 meters per second on an optimized space plane. This is a lot of mass of rocket fuel used to make up this difference, and it's a lot more than the mass of just the rapier engines. However, I'm really only interested in limiting the amount of dry mass that actually reaches orbit. And during experimenting with the Tylo landing, I discovered that the Wolfhound engines are really pretty incredible for that use, and they also help with orbiting from Kerbin. And as a result, I'm actually not going to use the rapier engines on closed cycle mode, for the Kerbin Ascent, and I'm just going to use the Wolfhound engines. These have about 33% higher TWR than the Rapier engines, which decreases the disadvantage of not being able to go as fast using just the Rapiers. To fill out the selection of engines, I'm also using two Nuke engines and four Ion engines, which have been burning most of the Ascent just to help out a little bit. Once we get very close to orbit, I'm going to turn off the three Wolfhound engines, and the two Nukes will get us the rest of the way to orbit with a little bit of help from the ion engines. During the ascent, the ion engines were being run off the alternators on the rocket engines, but once I get close to space, I can deploy the solar panels and start using them again. After reaching low Kerbin orbit, I'm only going to be using the ion engines powered by the solar panels until I reach low Tylo orbit. The burn from low Kerbin orbit to elliptical Kerbin orbit took a very long time with just four ion engines, but it was pretty standard, so let's skip to the actual ejection burn. For my final ejection burn from elliptical Kerbin orbit into interplanetary transfer for EVE, I had the same issue as the previous video where my TWR was too low to do this maneuver practically all at once. As a result, I'm going to eject myself into orbit of Kerbal, and after several orbits of Kerbal, I'm going to have another rendezvous with Kerbin where I'm going to finish up the job. When I re-rendezvoused with Kerbin, I discovered that somebody had put the moon in the way. At first, I was irritated, figuring I would have to replan my approach of Kerbin, but then I discovered that the moon was pretty much in the right place and could actually save me some Delta V in the final ejection from Kerbin to Eve. It reduced the total value of the ejection burn by about 20 meters per second, 
But the fuel savings as a result of this were actually higher because doing an extremely long burn with low TWR, you end up wasting some delta V because you can't make full use of the Oberth effect. So this might have saved me as much as 40 or 50 meters per second of ion fuel. After doing my final ejection burn from Kerbin, I'm going to be using the fairly standard gravity assist route to get me from the interplanetary transfer to EVE all the way on to Joule. I'm going to bounce off of EVE and then Kerbin twice, and that'll allow me to pick up enough relative speed to Kerbin to do one final gravity assist off of Kerbin, which will fling me all the way to Joule. Once I rendezvous with Joule, I use a gravity assist off of Tylo to capture, and then use additional gravity assists off of Lathe and Val to slow down my orbit, so I finally get a rendezvous of Tylo with as low of a relative velocity as possible. Reducing my relative velocity to Tylo is critical here, and not just for saving delta V. Because the solar panels don't work so well all the way out by Joule, I really do have to do this all at once because the trickle of power from the solar panels at this point is only enough to power one-fourth of one ion engine, and that is just not enough delta V to get anything done. Because the orbits of Lathe, Val, and Tylo are so close together in terms of delta V, I could get an approach of Tylo where even my small battery bank is enough to do the capture burn all at once. Now that I've captured an elliptical orbit of Tylo, I now face another very long sequence of burns to get to a low Tylo orbit. Before I start the Tylo landing, let me talk about some of the philosophy here. In any vacuum landing, the main enemy is losing delta V due to gravity. And there'll always be some of this because as soon as you're moving slower than orbital speed, you start falling towards the planet, and that's vertical velocity that needs to be canceled out by the engines at some point. The main way to reduce this is just to burn at an angle. You're essentially cutting the diagonal between the horizontal velocity that you already needed to cancel out and the vertical velocity that you're gaining. However, any diagonal vector is still going to be greater than two non-zero components. So as a result, we want to minimize the amount of time we spend moving slower than orbital speed because that's the time where we're picking up vertical velocity that needs to be canceled out. And we especially want to minimize time that we spend a lot slower than orbital speed because then we're gaining it faster. This competes against the fact that I also want to use high ISP low thrust engines that will make it take me longer to land and will make me pick up more vertical speed that has to be canceled out. We can combine these two things by starting by just using the high ISP engines and then adding in the less efficient engines later when we're going a lot slower than orbital speed. So as a result, I'm going to start my landing maneuver by turning on just the nuke engines and the ion engines. I'm not going to just use the ion engines first because these will eventually be limited by the capacity of the batteries, so just having them on and not the nukes wouldn't save me anything. I'm going to stay pitched up a bit to prevent myself from picking up too much vertical speed, and then at 2,000 meters per second surface speed, I'm going to turn on the three Wolfhound engines, which have about half the ISP of the nukes, but are still a lot more efficient than any other conventional rocket engine. In what I think is the most surprising facet of this mission, I'm not going to use the rapier engines at all for this descent. I had always assumed that the high gravity of Tylo meant that a single stage design would need to use all the engines it had brought to be efficient here. However, I did the math and this just wasn't the case. Breaking this assumption and using just the Wolfhound engines was a big part of how this mission jumped from impossible to possible. My targeted landing zone is at 8,600 meters, and to keep this as efficient as possible, I'm going to try to come in as low as as flat as possible. Because of the rugged landing area, the landing will have to be a little slower than would typically be necessary. For the final touch, I turn on the rapier engines for a brief moment just to help me rotate the craft's nose down. After touching down, I have a very bumpy ride across the surface. I'm not turning on the brakes just yet because I want to try to coast up to the top of the hill and then stop there. Bill has made it all the way from the Kerbal Space Center to the surface of Tylo without any staging, but the craft is now only about 42% of its original mass. So let's see if we can scrape enough fuel out of the fuel tanks to make it back. By landing on top of a mountain, we'll be able to save a lot of delta V during the takeoff by simply coasting down this hill 
to pick up velocity without having to use the rocket engines. After coasting down the slope and picking up quite a bit of speed, I taxied for a little while before finding an adequate ramp, and then flipped on the engines for the ascent to orbit. As with the descent, the rapier engines are going to be left unused due to their relatively low ISP. This ascent from Tylo is the last high TWR maneuver in the mission, so I'm going to leave the Wolfhound on until I'm out of oxidizer. I'm doing pretty well on my fuel budget. I only would have to reach about 1,730 meters per second before running out of oxidizer, but I end up having enough to get all the way up to 1,800 meters per second. At 1,800 meters per second, it'll just be the nuke engines and the ions doing the rest of the work. This is a different story than on the descent, because we're about a third of the mass compared to what we were before starting the Tylo descent. My efforts in saving Delta V pay off, and I'm able to reach orbit with 1.8 tons of liquid fuel remaining. Now all that needs to be done is see if the ion engines can bring us on home. After reaching elliptical Tylo orbit, my first step will be to burn into a transfer orbit to Val. Since we haven't done any close flybys yet in this mission, I decided that the gravity slingshot off of Val offered a pretty good opportunity to do the first one, but not the last one. The approach of Val will slingshot me onto an approach with Lathe, and I'll then proceed to steal some Delta V from both Lathe and Tylo before doing a final rendezvous with Tylo to eject me from the Jewel system. This final gravity assist off of Tylo will fling me all the way home to Kerbin, but I'll be going too fast to aero brake, so I'm going to do two gravity assists off of Kerbin, and then one more off of Eve, which will find me an approach of Kerbin with a much lower relative velocity, so I will be able to capture with just an arrow brake. Before arrow breaking down to a low Kerbin orbit, I decided that Bill really has too much fuel remaining. This is, this is looking way too safe, so I decided he should go and attempt a Minmus landing. Usually when landing on Minmus, one doesn't have to worry about their TWR because it only has about half a meter per second squared of gravity, but I only get about a seventh of a meter per second squared out of my ion engines, and I'm almost out of ion fuel, so it's a good thing we had a little bit of liquid fuel left remaining. Since I'm running low on both liquid fuel and xenon fuel, I'm not going to worry about using my ion engines for as long as possible before turning on the nukes, and I'm just going to try to get real close to the surface before turning on all the available engines left. While the landing gear on this thing would have no trouble touching down at orbital speed on Minmus, it's really hard to stay in contact with the surface without bouncing off, so I ended up slowing down to about 30 meters per second before actually touching down and then trying to use the wheel brakes to slow down the rest of the way. I almost forgot where I was for a second and tried to turn around on the surface when still moving at about 13 meters per second, which on Minmus was enough to make the craft flip over and Luckily, and somehow, nothing broke. To celebrate this surprise additional landing, Bill attempted some both literal and figurative moonwalking on top of the craft. And now for our final magic trick, we'll have to somehow get this plane to limp the rest of the way home with just a sliver of fuel left in the tanks. For the takeoff run, I'm going to again use the trick of coasting down a hill to pick up some speed. I'm on a very shallow hill and the gravity is very low, so it's going to take me a very long taxi run to pick up any significant amount of speed. I managed to get up to about 20 meters per second just coasting, and then use just the ion engines up to about 30 meters per second before turning on the nuke engines and taking off. For the rest of the ascent, I'm going to expend the remainder of my liquid fuel, and then just use the ion engines to get the rest of the way to orbit. And unlike on Tylo, I do have to ascend at a bit of an upward angle because there are some hills that are higher than this one that I am a little bit worried about hitting. Even with all the fuel expended, my TWR from the ion engines is still pretty low, so I'm going to still burn into an elliptical orbit of Minmus before doing my final ejection. My final ejection burn from Minmus will put me onto a transfer orbit to the Mun, which will slingshot me into an orbit of Kerbin, that will intersect with the atmosphere and allow me to arrow break the rest of the way down. Now that we're orbiting Kerbin again, and we have a periapsis under 70 kilometers, no more fuel usage is needed. So let's take stock of what we had and what we used. 
We started the mission with 181 tons of fuel, and we only have 313 kilograms remaining. That means that of the fuel we started with, less than two tenths of a percent of it is left remaining. However, all of it that's remaining is extremely efficient xenon fuel, which means we actually have about 232 meters per second of delta V out of it. But this isn't enough to go anywhere, so we're just going to land. I will say that this plane did not fly quite as well on the final curb and descent as the last one, due to the lack of a tail fin that wanted to crab to the side all the time, and the center of mast has moved significantly in front of our center of pressure, which makes it fairly unmaneuverable, but it can keep the nose pitched up enough to prevent itself from overheating. Because the shock cone doesn't make nearly as heat resistant of a nose cone as a fairing, I did have to slow down quite a bit more before doing my obligatory low pass over the mountains. The mountains also let me know that I had moved quite a bit to the south during this approach, so I maneuvered back to the north before lining up with the runway. As I come into the runway and this mission draws to a close, let me say that I am as surprised as anyone is by the fact that this mission worked. Due to my past experience, I just had assumed that this mission was impossible, and I went into this with the expectation that I would fail. And I was even more surprised when I found out that I really had quite a bit of extra Delta V to play with. Uh, this really just speaks to the power of moving past assumptions and trying things even if you think they won't work. So thank you everyone very much for watching and stay tuned for more.